I'm going to start with the easiest question of the day. Will you both say and spell your names for me and tell me your ranks and how long you worked for the North Carolina Department of Public Safety? Who wants to start? Go for it. Uh, my name is George Midget, uh, G-E-O-R-G-E-M-I-D-G-E-T-T. -E -E um, I'm a correctional officer. I was the canteen officer at the time, which was my position there. And I've been with the state for 17 years. My name is Curtis Casper, C-U-R-T-I-S-C-A-S-P-E-R. -S um, I was a correctional sergeant three. I was the armor for Pasatank and for the coastal region. I've been with the state for 10 years. For someone who's not familiar with work in prisons, what does that mean? What did you do? What was your job? Um, my job was, uh, I was in charge of like, um, uh, the weapons, uh, you know, the maintenance on them, uh, make sure staff had, you know, only thing we carry in the prison and a closed custody facility is pepper spray, batons, uh, your radio, stuff like that. Um, you know, for people that went outside of the prison, like for transportation and whatnot. Uh, I took care of like the ballistics vest, and, uh, your handcuffs, all um, anything you would need to secure an inmate. Um, that's what I was in charge of. In charge of taking care of uh, like uh, the ma the maintenance on the on the, gun the on your weapons and whatnot. Um, I did that for the whole coastal region. George, why did you want to work for the Department of Corrections? Seemed like a good job at the time. Um, the pay is a little is is above a minimum wage, and um, I had a family to support, and it's steady work. Uh, State seemed like a good idea working for the government. What about you, Curtis? Um, it was a it was a change for me. I was uh, I worked in uh, fire and rescue before before this. Um, I remember I was confronted one day from uh, another uh, manager there uh, telling me I should look into it. And, and I did, and uh, it ended up being a good good thing. Uh, the state is huge. Uh, your opportunities is wherever you want to take it, as far as you can, if you push hard, you can, you can advance. And I had a very promising career with them. Before this all happened, did you feel safe going to work every day? Um, yes and no. Uh, there's always that, that thought that something could happen. Um, I'm not oblivious to that. I mean, it's, we're working at a facility where you got every, everything, you know, rapists, murderers, I mean, you name it, they got it. Uh, it's just, the thing is, if you go in there with the respect and do, doing your job, it's normally not as bad, but not saying, we're not dealing with normal people. I mean, they they'll can flip out at any time. I mean, there's been numerous codes we've run to or it be inmate on inmate, or it be inmate on staff. I mean, you're you're dealing with people with uh, got um, disorders and stuff. You know, you know management pro, you know anger problems and and different things. So it's I can't say that I don't think about that. It's always you know I'll go in. I went in every day with the mindset that I was going to go home whatever it took. What about you, George? Did you feel safe going to work every day? Um, being safe in the prison is, 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 it's kind of a, like you said, it's, you have to work with the inmates the, to a certain degree. And I worked in the canteen, which means I worked with a certain group of inmates every day. But you, you always keep in, in the back of your mind that something could happen. Um, you just hope it doesn't. Uh, but you can't let that 
one thought keep you from doing what you're supposed to be doing. You still do your job. So take me back to that day in October of 2017. What were both of your assignments that day? Where were you in the prison, George? Um, I was the uh, canteen officer. Every, every unit at the prison has kind of like a small store. And what I did was I uh, ordered the merchandise and uh, we stocked the canteens. And on that day, we have one unit that is away from the prison, the minimum camp. And I was, had gotten the van to the loading dock so that we could stock the van to get, go get the uh, minimum camp stocked out. And that's what I was doing that day. What about you, Curtis? Well, I was actually in Greenville, North Carolina that, that morning. We had left early that morning. I had a class that we were, we were teaching. We were doing a chemical munitions and less than lethal class and um, at Eastern Correctional. Um, I got back around the institution around about three o'clock that day, probably about 2.50 or somewhere around there. But when I got back is when when the first code was called. As I was coming through the gatehouse and going in, that's when the first code was called. For people who don't know that term, what does that mean? They called a code, uh, they had called a code four, which is an uh, inmate disturbance. Uh, normally means the inmates are fighting or whatnot. And what they had done is they had called a code four on unit two, which is the furthest unit back at the compound. And from where the inmates were actually at for trying to, um, where they were trying to escape from was on the loading dock, which is at the very front of the prison, close to the gatehouse area. So it was just a matter, you know, they, it was a diversion to get us to go to follow us away from where they were trying to be. What's going through your mind when you hear that code? Uh, honestly, at the very beginning when the code was called, it was just like any other day, you know, a code call, we respond to it. Um, it wasn't until I was running down the hallway and I heard one of my officer's voices that caught my attention in distress. And then that's when I elected to turn and run to where that was. Can you tell me what you heard? What I heard was uh, one of my officers come over the radio in distress, um, almost pleading for help, kind of, like, and, and saying that they were, it's, it's very vague in my, in my mind, but yet I, 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 I can hear her voice very clear. But she was saying, you know, basically that they were escaping. And I knew because in, 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 our, in our institution, at that institution there, we, we know where we have our people. And I, I'm very close with my, with my people, and I knew where they were at. So hearing her voice, I knew that she was on the loading dock. So I was, like I said, I was in the middle of the hallway, so I turned and ran the opposite direction along with another person another supervisor that me and him worked together, we both had, we both had turned and ran towards the warehouse door. Um, at that time, when I came through the warehouse door is when we first got the first glimpse of the, what was actually going on. Um, what did you see? When we first come through that door, I seen uh, the inmates. I, it was one of them that was being a lookout because when you come through, you kind of come in, and to the left is where you have the loading dock. And it's kind of around the corner, so there was an inmate standing, you know, kind of watching out. And you could tell something won't go with something bad. You can hear a bunch of hollering and different things. And so we ran. I ran, and I ran after the inmates. When I came around the corner, that's when I seen Midget. Midget was laying on the floor, and he had been beaten very badly. It was, you know, it was just everything you could think of. It was a, it was a, it was a horror scene. It was, um, I'll be honest with you, I didn't even know it was beaten bad enough, and there was enough blood that I did not know who it was. So I immediately said to the people behind me, here, you know, 
take care, you know, take care of midget, and I ran after the inmates. The inmates had done ran out on the loading dock and was running to the fence, trying to go over the fence. So me and the other supervisor that was uh, that was with me when we turned and ran over, we both went out there and engaged the inmates. Uh, it's at that time when I was out there with the inmates and we were fighting that uh, I was able to get hold of one of them and I had got him, we, you know, trying to, he had a, what appeared to be a, a homemade weapon, a, a shank. And um, I, I could see that he had that. I could see that the other inmates had pepper spray. I could see that they had, you know, had things that they shouldn't have had, uh, hammers and different things. But I, I engaged this one trying to get between them and the fence. And in the process, as I had my hand on, on the weapon, I was struck in the back with a hammer. When I turned to try to get him off of me, it's when I in turn got stabbed in the face. So it was just a, it all happened so fast. And, you know, people jumped in and tried to do what we could do. But at this time, the only thing we really knew is that the officer midget had been, when we had an officer there that had been severely beaten. That's all we really knew at the present moment. I do believe it was around that time they started calling other codes for fire and different things in the uh, sewing plant. Um, but at that present moment, that's what was taking place. When did you learn that there were other people who were hurt? Well, um, as I, like I said, I was stabbed in the face and I backed off. I kept calling for certain things. I was calling for less than lethal. I was trying to get command to answer and different things like that, and it wasn't happening. So I quickly realized that somebody had to take control of this. Somebody had to be calling some shots. So I took, I removed myself. And when I removed myself, I, I started going back towards the loading up. By this time, we had all kinds of officers out there that were keeping the inmates away from the fence and doing what they could. I mean, Panic, I'm pretty sure there was a lot of them that were in panic, but it was just like for me that something triggered and you just went into an autopilot mode. Uh, at that time, when I went back up to loading dock and they were sitting there working on midget, there was another inmate that I had glimpsed coming back in, and he was uh, he was the canteen inmate. He worked with, uh, with Mr. George here, but he was... Uh, he was just pleading with me. He had nothing to do with it, that he tried to help. He tried to help, but he kept telling me to look in, look into the, look, need to open the elevator, open the elevator. So we opened the elevator. When we opened the elevator, that's when I seen one, another one of my officers, which was the loading the officer that day. And I seen how. I remember going in there and putting my hands on Shannon. Just pleading with her. It was going to be okay. It was going to be, it was going to be okay. But I remember trying to fill a pulse on both of them. And it, like I said, it was very weak at the time. Midget was our obvious choice to try to save. And that's a hard decision. That's a decision that who's supposed to make that? But anyways, we done it. You know, and like I said that day, there was no emotion in it for me at the present time. It was just something like something clicked and we just went with it. So I remember after that, I, I left and I and I I went back up front, and um, I I remember them calling in the command. And I answered them, and they said that uh, the inmates had, were trying to go over the went over the first fence. So I immediately ran, and and instead of going to get less than lethal at the time, I went ahead and got you know got my service weapon from the gatehouse and 
and got a car and went around for where the inmates were trying to come across. At this time, they had already captured two of them, and two of them were still out, and that was Brady and um, I'm drawing a blank for a minute. But I had it was the two that had attacked me. I held them at gunpoint. I had two rovers there. They were whole, they were they were out with their weapons and everything. I got them to back off and I held them at gunpoint. At this time I had the sheriff's department coming up, you know, pulling up. We had I mean, it was phenomenal how many how many the response that we had from outside law enforcement to show up and help us. Um, but like I said, you know, state troopers and everything, they, they, they you had a trooper and a sheriff, uh, one of the deputies that went onto the yard with the vehicles. They had already held everybody back. So it was just, it was the, the trooper and deputy, myself and some deputies on the other side, and we're giving commands to these inmates. Um, Frazier, inmate Frazier was the other one. And uh, they were standing there. And at that time, I had one pleading for his life. So I'm saying, don't shoot me, don't shoot me. And then the other one, which was Brady, pleading for us to kill him because of everything that he had done. And uh, I'll be honest with you, at this time, I still didn't, I knew where these inmates had come from. I knew that these inmates come out of the soul plant. So in the back of my mind, I am sitting here thinking about what does the up there look like? What is going on? Because Smith, Smith was my right hand. Justin Smith, I was training to take my my spot. I mean, I, I remember saying that his at his funeral, I told the family and everything, you know, jokingly, but I asked him one day, you know, we were in the gatehouse, and I asked him, I said, well, so what's your goals? I got goals. What's your goals? He said, well, sorry, honestly, it's to take your job. And what, what what better way to say, you know, as a compliment for you? Because if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, you should be advancing anyways. So therefore, with us advancing, you know, he should advance. And someone took a chance on me, so obviously I've taken a chance on him. Uh, he was just, you know, him and Shannon both, they were both my officers, and that was tough. You know, that was tough because they were two people that I had really pushed to get in my section because they they did their job so well and, and were eager to learn, that which made it in return easier for you to teach them. Um, I enjoyed that part of it. I mean, what better way to love your job than trying to teach someone else everything that you know? I want the type of person to hold anything back. So all this stuff is going through my mind about Smith and them. I don't know anything yet. Um, I'm getting reports over the radio, but it's still vague. <laughs> I remember them calling me and, and uh, telling me that rescue was almost there when they needed to get them in. So they... We had an officer that st stood up, and uh, actually the other supervisor that was with me at the time, he ended up sticking right there to help assist in getting rescue and the fire department and everything in the gate and everything, which our main concern at that present time was public safety. You know, that's far, that's our main thing in prison is uh, our number one priority, and you can ask me, it, is, is what? Public safety. Supposed to protect the public. And we did that. I can honestly say that all, every officer that was working that day with us and that were there, we did exactly what we had to do that day. And, uh, and that was to protect the public. Unfortunately, we had to lose people for that to happen. But once we got involved, no one else's life was lost. And um, I think the staff deserves all the credit for that. Not not management, but staff itself. Um, 
it started out pretty good. Uh, just prior to this, I had uh, brought a van into the loading dock so we could load the um, merchandise for the other unit in the van. And uh, I was coming back up on a loading dock, and the inmate I work with every day came running past me and told me to run. And you know, out of the blue, you just, I just kind of looked around, run from what? And when I turned back around, there was a, an inmate standing directly in front of me with a um, shank. It was a half a scissors with a blade about so long. At least it looked like it was about that long at the time. And uh, he said, I don't want to hurt you, but we've got to go. I told him, I said, you, you realize I can't let you go. And uh, then I felt um, something hit me in the head. At the time, I didn't know what it was. I just knew that I felt something hit me in the head hard and uh, kept hitting. And I uh, ended up on the ground. And I got hit from back here, all the way across, forehead, um, nose, and then he uh, crushed that cheek, the uh, orbital eye socket. Um, but I didn't know all that. I'm, I mean, I'm steadily getting hit. I don't remember being stabbed. I was stabbed through the side, uh, in my side, through my lung. Um, and I was just trying to cover my head. Keep, and I got dragged in to the other room and uh, my consciousness kind of skipped in and out. Uh, as far as uh, length of time, I really couldn't tell you because, you know, 10 seconds felt like 10 minutes. Um, I remember staff running past me. Um, I couldn't see because of the blood that was in my eyes. And uh, two of the staff stayed with me and kept talking to me and telling me everything's going to be all right. Um, uh, I couldn't breathe, so I had to sit up. I couldn't lay down. I had to sit up to breathe. And it just seemed like it took forever, but I was so happy when the, I first knew officers had gone past me. Because that meant something was going to happen. And uh, uh, one of the people that stayed with me gave me uh, a shirt, because everybody wears a um, T-shirt under their, their uniform and their clothes, and to put on my head to help stop the bleeding. Um, Not until I actually got to the hospital. Um, I was fairly certain between laying there in the blood and go getting to the hospital that I was going to die. Um, but when I got to the hospital, they told me that I had skull showing, bone showing from here up and down my head. And my wife, they had finally called my wife and gotten her to come out there. And I holded her hand and uh, knowing that they were doing the best they could, I finally felt like I was going to live. But uh, I was told later that I was hit 12 to 14 times with a hammer. Um, and stabbed, but I didn't find any of that out until, like I said, I got to the hospital. Did you ever think that anything like this would happen to you? Shoot, no, that doesn't happen. Um, I mean, you get inmates to try to escape and such, but it's usually they want to climb the fence or they want to try to dig under it and, and but not escape the way they escape. I mean, the first part of their plan had to have been 
we're going to set a fire for, the, for distraction, and then we're going to kill at least these two people. And then whoever gets in our way on the way down. Who comes up with a plan like that? They could have easily just incapacitated everybody and gone out. As a matter of fact, they would have been able to get out faster. But they took the time to severely beat everybody they came in contact with. When you think about the decision Curtis and some of your fellow officers had to make that day, what goes through your mind? Through, through my mind? The uh, decisions they were making, like I said, code uh, was finally called, people started coming in, and it was a relief to see staff. Um, as far as what was being said on the radio, uh, like I said, my consciousness was kind of an in and out thing, so I didn't get a, a whole lot of it. Um, I don't even remember uh, uh, Curtis seeing me at all. Um, I was out at that time. So Curtis, after all of this happened, the question that everyone keeps asking is how were these inmates able to do this? Complacency. Um, people not, people not listening to warning, management not listening to warning. Um, you know, we have a bad habit of saying, you know, it, it's going to take someone, it's going to take something very bad to happen for something to change. And, uh, and that's the wrong attitude. Uh, I remember myself and, and my supervisors. One supervisor in particular, she was a lieutenant, pushed so hard about needing staff, needing staff, uh, needed staff to be in the, uh, in the sewing plant, not just having one. And, um, and I agreed with her. I mean, and the response that we would get back from management was, I don't, I don't need to say on TV, but it was uh, basically, what do you want me to do? You know, and that's the response we got. And it's not, a, it's not a joking matter. I mean, this was, this is not something we should laugh about, but. Uh, that's the way it was treated a lot of times. Um, I really think that the state, you know, I've never believed in this whole, these inmates are better and these, I've never agreed with any of that stuff. Their inmates are inmates, I'm sorry. I I did my job, you know, I'm not saying that my past is squeaky clean, but, you know, I buy by the law and I, you know, I'm not in there. They broke the law. I didn't put them in there. They put themselves in there. So, I mean, they shouldn't have, I, I don't believe in a closed custody facility. They should have even had, you know, those types of tools and stuff. Um, I was one of them that did their the tool audits and stuff, and I remember asking questions about why did they have certain things. Because there was stuff... You know, there was, in my opinion, they needed to be up there. I mean, it was a sewing plant. All right, scissors. Why could why they got to have real sharp scissors? Why couldn't they, you know, why couldn't they have what they call safe scissors? For, you know, for, you know, I mean, my kids got to use them in school. What was the response when you would bring those issues to light? Well, I got some, you know, I did have some times where, some of the questions I had asked about certain tools and stuff like that, that they, you know, management agreed with me. Man, this don't make sense. You know, why do why they need a skill saw up there? Yeah, it's a sewing plant. So, you know, we found we were getting those things taken out. And um, it was just in time, you know. And then there was other times that they would agree with me. 
I believe the staff we had up there as far as the officer we had up there, because Smith, he was very thorough in doing his job. But he's just one person. Um, I'm, you know, another person up there in that sewing plant would have been, would have helped. Um, actually, you know, it calls for us to have two people up there. They consider it a pool post, but, you know, really honestly, I think that was a, it shouldn't have been. Um, we had a tendency of running with just putting one person back there, but we would constantly ask for staff. I had a I had a lieutenant. Uh, she's basically been my supervisor since I started, you know, through through my career. And uh, she, uh, I remember her going to management and pleading that she needed people and she needed more staff. And the response she would get from management, upper management, was, you know. What am I supposed to do? You know, and, and I mean, their their response was a little more nastier than that. But uh, basically, you know, it was just like, <laughs> I mean, you find them, you can get them. We don't have them. Uh, my my thing is on a lot of that. Well, when we get to a point that we can't cover certain things like that, why do we allow them to keep getting the things that they get? Stop it. They don't have to. I mean, I know the state says they have to have so much time on the yard and different things like that, but okay. We're, what do they say? We're like 25% vacancy. That's a lot. You're, 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 you're putting your staff in danger by doing stuff like this. Um, you're asking for trouble. And you know, one thing I never agree with it was this whole these inmates are better and whatnot. Their inmates are inmates. Uh, this is close custody. They should have never had these type of weapons and, and stuff, you know, these type of tools. Uh, you know, close custody facility, anywhere else in that facility, if, it, if there's a tool that needs to be issued out, there's a tool officer or some, there's a, someone in maintenance that would sign that tool out, not an inmate that would sign that tool out. A staff that was signed up too well, and it had to be returned. Enterprise was run different, and I didn't agree with that. Enterprise was run that an inmate signed out their tools and stuff, and at the end of the day, the officers would check and make sure it was there. That day alone, I believe, and, and I don't blame our officers for this because they can't help what what we give them. You know what I mean? They they have to do what we the job that they're put there to do. But that day there, you had you had an inmate that was going and checking out tools. I mean, just unnecessary tools, just checking them out, and another inmate signing them out to him, just signing them out to him, and he was setting himself up, putting it in another room, just waiting, just planning. And, you know, I've seen these things on video. You know, not many people have seen those videos, but I have. And, and, and what happened there is just shouldn't have never happened. Um, the, the, the employees that work in correctional enterprise, they're not certified. Only certified person that was up in there was Smith, Justin Smith. And he can't leave those inmates, but they had inmates, what they would do. And, you know, when I say complacency, this is the thing I'm talking about. One thing we're not supposed to do in prison is to let up or let her know a timeline of events. Well, these inmates knew that on Thursday, we're going to take the trash down. We're going to go down the freight elevator. We're going to be down there. The loading dock office is going to open up. But they're going to be taken down by a correctional enterprise person, not a staff member, you know, a correctional officer. They're going to be taken down by a correction. They knew that. They knew, you know, they knew these things. So they manipulated themselves to. So once they got back there beyond 
camera's view. And that was the other thing. You know, there's 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 certain way, you know, these cameras are in there. But we didn't do our part. The state didn't do their part in ensuring that these inmates couldn't see these cameras, the what they show. So they would show the blind you know, this particular inmate, Brady, he knew every blind spot these cameras had. And, and I'm going to tell you how you know this. is because when he, as he's checking out the tools, he would go just, just out of sight of the camera. And that's where he was storing his stuff and putting things in, off to the side. So it's at the side of the camera, and it's, it's hard to see. To where, to where they even brought Smith in and took him to the back. And carry out their plan and it's just you know it makes sure to know where these cameras are they knew that once they got back there beyond those security doors and to go down that elevator and everything there's no cameras there they knew this they knew that they could they could hide things and i just think the accountability on that part was poor um so, George, when you think about all of the things that Curtis just listed, all of the lapses, do you think what happened that day could have been prevented? Yes. And that's a 100% yes. We were short on staff. And you've got a enterprise, which was the sewing plant, that has um, violent inmates. Uh, their records are, are violent, which should not have been anywhere near that type of um, environment with the tools being passed out by an inmate. Um, there's only one officer, Officer Smith. With a, the policy stated there should be two. So if you don't have enough staff to, to effectively and securely run that, the, the easiest thing to do would be to just shut it down. Um, which is what uh, Sergeant Casper said. If you don't have enough people to watch it safely, then it, should never, it never should have been opened. Um, we had the, the, the freight elevator that went to there was the only elevator in the entire prison without a camera. It's the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's the only elevator not controlled by a um, sure. officer in a control room. That's right. Um, in a place where they have tools. In a place where they have tools. Like I said the shank that was that was used on me for was a, it was a half of a scissors. Um, long steel sh uh, scissors that they just took apart and that gave them two good shanks. Who do you hold responsible for what happened to you? Um, upper management and as far up as Raleigh. Um, in, in operations you, uh, you, you have your narrative and it has how many people you have working and where they're assigned. So DPS in Greenville or Raleigh can't say they didn't know we were short because they got those reports every day. Um, it, it doesn't take a, a genius that if you've got a um, a unit that is required to have eight people, eight officers on that unit, and you've got four, and you know there's a problem. Um, and on, on that narrative also is where your people are assigned. So they had to have known that they were running a sewing plant with violent offenders and one officer. I, I like to say too, on that, you know, enterprise is treated so different. Um, 
you can bring up things, but what what was, what the I'm gonna tell you what it boils down to. Enterprise is a million dollar business. They don't they're not state funded. They're they're they ha- they create their own budget because of the money that they bring in. And so a lot of times by management and different ones where we see fit as a, as a normal people so that we need to shut that down, they see is a necessity they need to keep at the very minimum have that running because that's a that's a business for them. And, uh, and I think that's wrong. All because of an almighty dollar, you're willing to jeopardize my life, his life. Is that, is, that, is that right? No, I don't, I don't believe it is. What's happened to you since then? To me? Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's been bad. I mean, uh, I went for two months after this, and uh, I tried to work for the first two weeks. I tried to go to work, and I, and, but I was just a shell there. I didn't even realize what I was doing to my family, you know. And what what really gets me is the state let me do it. Because I was willing to be there, the state let they didn't tell me, you know. Yeah, they might say, oh, you need to go home. Or did they walk me out the door? No. Oh, come on in. So I had, you know, I took it upon myself at the time that I took it personal because... I remember laying in the hospital that night, and I'm asking about my officers, and they and I ask about Shannon, and different one, and they tell me that they they airlifted Shannon and Midget and Hal. And I, and I remember so I started asking questions about Smith, and nobody wanted to tell me anything. Nobody wanted to tell me anything. They finally told my dad, and my dad told me. And let me tell you something, you know, from that moment right then. I started crying, and I immediately wanted revenge. I was, I was just, I was mad. Uh, I remember going to the prison, so I felt like what I had to do is because I knew those guys in that sewing plant. I, I knew them by name. I could call them out. I felt like I needed to watch the video, and I could. I wanted everybody that was involved in it. So the state allowed me to watch the murders take place on video. Only thing that did was affect me. Yes, we did what we had to do. We got, we still got our four, and I've seen some other things that, you know, I hope that come to light. But, um, it messed me up. You know, they try to tell me I had the first signs of PTSD, I didn't want to hear that. I didn't want to be labeled. I didn't want to be labeled because all I wanted to do was go back to work. And then uh, my therapist, she took me out of work. I was furious because that's not what I wanted. And and all the time, I was hurting my family and all this. They're trying to help me, but I won't even allow them. And, you know, so then for like, like I said, two months there, it was... Um, I try to do things on my own. I try. I, I didn't. I'd go to. The, I'd go to my therapy appointments, and I just whatever they wanted me to say, I said it, and try to. You know, just yes, 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 yes. And since that time, you no longer work there. Yeah, and what has happened is, uh, I ended up realizing my therapist. I have a really good therapist. She's she's really really good. Uh, she uh, she broke me. She finally got me to crack. And all those emotions that I didn't have that day, I started getting. And the nightmares at night, there's not a night right now that goes by that I don't have flashbacks, nightmares about it or anything. I, I, it's every day. I go many nights and don't even sleep. I'm still in that same boat that I was on October 12th, 2017. I am still fighting the same things that I was fighting in. The thing that hurts me the most about the state is that I was one of your first responders as well as many other people were that day. 
that were first responders. Well, how, what are you going to do for us? You know, this didn't this didn't stop with me. You know, that day happened. That's not it. You know, I hate it for the families that they lost loved ones. They got their things that they have to go through. But I'm still alive. I'm still here. And for them to turn around in a year's time, I'm seeking all kinds of help. I go to therapy once a week. And they turn around and send me a letter saying that they want to separate me. And then they turn around and separate me. I mean... Basically, the way I feel is that I have been punished for doing my job. And I don't believe that's, that's right. I shouldn't feel that way. I don't believe that, you know, I should feel that. I believe that the state should have been behind me 100%. I haven't heard from none of them. This, there's a couple people that I was real close with that have called me, but they know not to talk to prison, talk prison around me because I don't want to hear it. It's so negative, and I I don't need that in my life. I have enough that I have to live with it now, you know, and it's every day. And it affects my family. It affects everything. You know, the mood swings I have, the, the you know, it's the financial part of it, you know. I have to drive to these appointments myself. I, I done seen probably seven different psychiatrists, uh, I was doing a program called EMDR with uh, one therapist. I was seeing it. So I, I had times that I was going to therapies and stuff three times a week and then twice a week. You know, right now I'm going once a week, you know, but and that's been going on since the beginning. And I, I really honestly, some days I feel like I'm doing good. Other days I feel like. Is this even? Is any of this even working? I have to take medications now. My health has gone gone down. Uh, you know, and it's just tough. I don't like being around a lot of people. I, you know, and, I, and I'm working on that. But that's some, it takes time. And the fact that the state wouldn't give you that time, I just think it's crazy. We're first responders. You know, all in the fire department, you're first responder. You get taken care of. You know, law enforcement gets taken care of. What about what about corrections? I mean, look how horrific that was. You know, I had to sit there. It wasn't just any old officer to me. These are mine. These are my people. These are my officers. You know, two weeks there, right after the incident, for two weeks, it was the it was terrible for me because I you had Jeffrey Howe and Shannon Wendy Shannon still in ICU. And then I sat there, and I'm having survivor's guilt. I mean, you, you name it, I've had it. I'm sitting there wondering, you know, did I make the right call that day? You know, I started second-guessing myself, and, you know, and I constantly do that. I'm doing it now. George, what about you? What do you think about how the states responded and treated you? Hmm. Um, poorly. Uh, when this first happened, um, I'd get visitors from various levels with, of the state, but uh, that was that lasted maybe a week, um, and after that, uh, nobody check, nobody checked on me, um, and I I wasn't going anywhere. Um, it was just, it's like the, the state, once they found out you were going to be, once I was going to be all right, or as close as all right as I'm ever going to get, um, it was, they just forgot. Um, some of the things they did were just unusual. Uh, No, uh, like I said, no, nobody checking to see if you're all right. Now, when I, when I was in the hospital, I was in the hospital for a week, and of course, there was constantly somebody being up there. Um, but once I got home, and I live 10 minutes from the prison, 
Uh, the superintendent could have come over to our house and said something. The assistant superintendent, somebody. Uh, after that first week, that was it. It was just uh, me doing what I had to do to survive. You guys have um, since hired an attorney. Can you tell me why you thought that was important, why you guys took that step? Um, believing that the state on their own is going to do right uh, is ludicrous. Um, they have proven time and time again, not with just what happened with us, but what happens anywhere, anywhere else with the prison, uh, prison system. Um, they are not going to take care of anybody. It's not in their budget. Um, I was just, I have, I have headaches and dizziness and nausea every day. Um, it just depends on how bad it is, but it's at least there every day and some days it's worse than others. Um, I can't, I can't drive. It, as a passenger in a car, if we take a right hand turn, my dizziness ramps up a lot. Um, the off ramps, I'm, I'm gone for like 20, 30 minutes with those. Um, and I have a, a kind of a buzz, a disassociation or disorientation or whatever they want to call it. Um, definitely not somebody you want on the road. And they have recently uh, decided that I apparently don't need any more care. I got a letter saying that uh, they were closing my case. Um, what was that like for you to read? <laughs> not real good. I've still got doctors I've got to go see. Um, uh, uh, trauma doctor and a neurologist. Um, among other things, but at least those two. Um, Do you think you're going to get separated? Oh, I'm fairly certain I'm going to get separated, uh, particularly after this airs. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's coming. They, they've already told me that they can only uh, keep me a maximum of two years. And of course, this year when October comes around, that's going to be it. So the state has put out press release after press release giving all of these lists of things that they've changed, that they've tried to hire more people and do more training and order stab-resistant shirts and, and things like that. And they think that they are they're really reforming the prisons. With everything that they've done so far, do you think this will happen again? Yes. Absolutely. What makes you both say that? I, I believe this is... Uh... What they've done is give us, they're giving you, all right, they've said they're doing more training. All right, they, they give you a stab-resistant vest or something. That hasn't done anything to change. You haven't changed how the inmate population is, is running. You haven't changed how close custody is being treated, you know, how the inmates are being treated in there. You know, when you think close custody, you think maximum control and stuff like that, you know. You would think that we con we're controlling their movement. That's not the case. Yeah, they'll say that's what we're doing, but it's not the case. Uh, I, I just my biggest fear on all this is that the officers and stuff that we lost that day is that it's going to end up being in vain, and I don't think that's right. You know, they them. The, we shouldn't have never lost him. We shouldn't have had anybody else hurt. But why does it got to take something like that? And then it's still, it's almost like the prison still run the same way. I just don't agree with it. I, I don't. They were on lockdown for a period, a period of time. And in some of the remarks I was hearing that management was saying is, you can't punish them all for what 
some of them done, what a few did. I didn't say punish them. I know what we're supposed to do. The laws, the laws decide their punishment. We carry out what the law has deemed them necessary. So what I'm saying is, okay, maybe they do need to be locked down more. They're, if they have enough points that they end up in close custody or something like that, they, like, there again, I didn't do that to them. They done that their self. And I think that's the things that need to be looked at. Not, you know, why do they got to be out doing this? Why do they got to be, you know, I, I don't know ever, I haven't ever agreed with it. Some people believe that they should be out working and doing this stuff. I, I don't think that's the case. They lost those rights as far as I'm concerned. It's, it's, a, it's sad to me to hear another inmate tell us, oh, we got more rights than y'all. And that happens. That happens in there. That, and they'll taunt you with that. Is that right? No, that's not right. So some of them, you know, they're repeat offenders. They come in, they go out, they come in, they go out. That's what they do. So as a prison system, are we... Is, all we're doing is enabling them? Well, what are we doing? I think there's some things that, you know, that could be changed on that. And I'm not saying I got the answers by God. I, I, you know, I know that's got to be a tough thing, but you know what? They need to start taking heed of it, though. They need, to, they need to start doing something and not what they're doing. I mean, I guarantee if we went to the prison right now and walked through past tank, I bet you they're... I bet you I can walk on a unit and the inmates are out walking in the core area. I, I, you know, and I bet you you can, you can go in certain places of prison if, and, and I could find an inmate going down the hallway that ain't supposed to be going down this hallway, but yet they let him out. Why are you going down the hallway? What are you doing coming down here to the warehouse? You know, I, I, believe, I believe that's still going on right now. So... How are you going to tell me that's controlled movement? Controlled movement in my mind, okay, I'm going to have so many offers to so many inmates. We're going to move them down as a group. Once that's done, then we'll go on something else. So prison has changed so much in five years, I would say. In five years, I think it's it's really changed. Now it's, let's, we got to make sure they get this. They got to make sure they get that. Got to make sure they get this. You're not even worried about your staff. You're worried about the inmates. I think that's backwards. We can get the inmates what they're supposed to have, but you should. You need to be looking out for your staff. I believe if that right there would happen, they would be the state would be surprised at how much it would turn around that prison if they would do exactly that. Look out for their officers because there's times you feel like. They look out for them inmates more so than they ever look out for you. And you shouldn't feel that way. That's a good note to end on. That was all I had. Is there anything else that you guys wanted to add that you don't think that we hit on?